Lloyd Day, yeah, congregational leader from Bethlehem back in the day when many of us first started. Hallelujah. And Dr. Joe and their congregation with Natan Lawrence and Hoshana Rabah were affiliated with us, or sisters. We did festivals together. Um, Dr. Joe's out of Wilsonville and the Beaverton area, right? Vernonia now. Vernonia now. Vernonia now. Hallelujah. And his wife Heidi is with us, so we welcome them back. He's an old, longtime friend. And this was on a Shavuot, yeah. right? And one of them, uh, Heidi made the loaves. What what talented artwork! <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, wheat bundles down the middle kadosh lo yahweh holy to yahweh holy to the lord hallelujah praise yah amen one of my favorite message of all time is dr joe giving a shavuot message about how the disciples saw and heard from yeshua in on the throne room hallelujah how the portal in heaven was opened up and they saw and heard Yeshua standing at the right hand of the Father in all his glory and his majesty and the spirit was poured out upon them when that portal opened up and they saw Yeshua in all his glory hallelujah standing there that was a very inspiring message faith building for me and I really appreciate that Amen. so I've heard the Holy Spirit gave you more today yeah so yeah hallelujah okay amen which praise yeah hallelujah and everybody know that uh, joe and heidi are uh, rebecca's parents and rebecca and peter son-in-law hallelujah and they have a granddaughter grandbaby ruth hallelujah so we welcome every the whole family oh we need to pull this out oh gotcha that's what it is thank go you ahead. go ahead well uh, yeah oops thank you David. oops So yeah, we uh, we had moved up to Vernonia. There we go. thank you. And uh, um, amazingly enough, there's uh, a bunch of Sabbath keepers up there too. You guys are so blessed to have such a nice big group here and a nice building of your own to be in. So just an incredible blessing. It's nice to see because it's that's a little bit rare in our movement to have your own building and the rest of that. Uh, most most folks are still just doing home fellowships. Oh, okay, right into, into the center of it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to leave. I, hopefully, I won't need my readers. Um, so it was an honor to uh, be asked to come down to share a little bit of a, a word with you all today. Um, I was. Uh, I know we spent a little bit of time at Sukkot, but you know, when I look around the room, there's a lot of folks that over the, the years we've been part of different congregations that we've been with with uh, with a lot of you. In fact, we were just reconnecting there uh, way back in Yeshua Hatikva, where I where I met my wife about 15 years ago or so. So it's. Uh, yeah, it's just really nice, and and yeah, serving at different sukkots and different functions over the years, with you guys and the, and the roses and all there. So, um, thank Father, we ask uh, that you would close us in for a while here as we talk about your word and, and learn of your ways, uh, that you'll transform us to be more like you. Uh, put write your word on our hearts, uh, and let that be a light so, so that we can serve as, as the function that you intended Israel to be, that light to the nations. Uh, and as we sang there, we don't want to let, let it hide our light under a bushel. We want to let it shine wherever we go. So fill up our storehouses, uh, fill these vessels with your Holy Spirit so we have the right way to communicate your message uh, in a loving way to a, just a hungry world out there. And as these times get darker and darker before you're coming, uh, let let our uh, let your people Israel be that light that you intended them to be. Ask that in Yeshua's name. So um, I, I, I was told that I'd have about twenty minutes or so. So it's funny when I first started getting into the uh, into the chapter, and I know it, it might be a little bit longer. So okay, um, that uh, right I, right in the first chapter, I started uh, getting revelation on things that I, I thought would be w worthy of sharing. So I, I didn't even really make it past chapter one in this portion on, on things that. Uh, that are, are worth sharing in a, in a short period of time. Um, I started, you notice, uh, uh, one five. it talks about the descendants of Jacob were 70 people that, that came down into Egypt because Joseph was already there. Now, when we hear that 70, that should be a cue to you that uh, for in Abba's eyes, that's all the nations of the world. 
with which I, I put in there, you'll see uh, this, the table of nations there in Genesis chapter 10 lays out the 70 nations. And we, and we see that 70 pattern being repeated over and over. Um, and not that uh, he looks down on or has any favoritism of any people. He really wanted all of us to be part of his people. Ephesians is clear about that, that you used to be some other nation, but now you're part of the commonwealth of Israel. Once, once you accept a new covenant with him, you've become part of his people. Um, later, Deuteronomy 32, 8 says that when, uh, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, he divided up all of mankind, and he set up the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. So there's another confirmation there that shows that the peoples of the earth uh, were, were numbered by that, those 70 nations. Um, I put in, there's tons of patterns in there. You know, when the Israelites left Egypt, one of the nice places they stopped at on, the, on their 42 journey, uh, uh, stop journey to the promised land was the place of Elim. Uh, when they got to Elim, they counted up the springs that were there and they found 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And I'm sure m uh, many of you can see the pattern there that 12 is his people Israel and, then, and they were to bring springs to the, tr to the trees, the leaders of all the, of the other nations, those palm trees. Um, I didn't put in that uh, the other one is the, uh, the 70 elders, uh, in including which was what uh, based the legal body in Israel, the, uh, the Sanhedrin, was a body of 70, and which I think they had an extra two. It may have been 72, just in case somebody had to be absent or something. So it's just kind of like we do in some of our court systems today, where we'll put a, a few extras just in case somebody has to be absent. But they were to be the ruling body, because that happened with uh, uh, Jethro there. Remember when he came? He came to Moshe, saw him out in the wilderness, and he was kind of wearing himself out by having to judge all these things all day long. And he said, hey, why don't you divide up this? Uh, and and he, uh, that kind of set up the same way our nation is set up by the Bible, that there's you know lower courts, and you bump yourself up depending on whether or not there's a, a very more difficult matter or not. The other th thing, the uh, commissions, remember Yeshua, the first he sent out the 12. And when he sent out the 12, he, he uh, told them, don't bring extra things because you're, you're going to, supposedly to friendly territory. You're going to, to, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that he had to get Israel ready first. But then the second commission, he sent, sent them out, uh, sent out the 70. And again, that pattern of he wanted them to go out to pull in the harvest of all the nations so that there'd be a great harvest. We know in the book of Revelation, it says uh, that from every nation, tongue, tribe, and people, he's going to get a harvest. So, and pull them all in, and then they'll all be his people. And there's plenty of places uh, Isaiah mentions, so does Ezekiel, about that whatever tribe the people uh, uh, journeyed with and sojourned with, they became part of that tribe, and they got their inheritance. We, same thing happened in the first uh, Exodus, that there was a mixed multitude that left, and we, again, whatever uh, tribe they, they felt akin with and... and uh, Sometimes Abba gives us natural giftings, and you'll just kind of fit in with a, a, a one group of group better than others. And so you'll just become part of that tribe, and you'll be, uh, become part of that inheritance. Um, I, I did put Isaiah 49 there because th that talks about why he wanted to restore the tribes of, of Jacob and bring that back those of Israel that he's kept because he wanted them to all be for a light to the, the, to the Gentiles, to the nations again to be, bring his message of salvation to all the ends of the earth. And nice, that's, the church has done that really pretty well. Uh, they've sent missionaries to different places and, and sent people to translate Bibles, and, and, and we have them in pr pretty much almost every major language today so that people can read God's word. It's amazing that uh, we live in such a time like this, that we're so blessed to... Um, there's not... Hi, Jim. <laughs> I know we was, uh, Jim has been part of a co different congregations in the past too before, but... Um, that, uh, yeah, where was I going with that? But it's the, uh, <laughs> yeah, like to the nations and, and that, uh, yeah, the time we live in now that it's, uh, with printing presses and such a wealthy people in the past, if you had a Torah scroll that took so many sheep that you had to slaughter and you had to hire a scribe for an entire year to write that. And, uh, so it's, what a blessing. Many of us even have more than one Bible in our house, you know, so, uh, we have access to these things. Let me bring that down for a moment. Okay. There we go. Yep. 
Um, so the next thing I saw there was that we saw a, a new king had ar arisen in Egypt, a king who didn't know Joseph. Um, these, remember when we're reading these, these things were examples set for us so, so that we would understand Yah's patterns. He keeps working in, in, in many of these patterns. And we, we can learn a lot about what's going to happen in the future by studying what happened in the past. Okay? And I believe that Pharaoh picture, as many others see it, it was a Satan-type uh, shadow, but it was uh, also kind of an Antichrist-type shadow. We, we see this, uh, and, you know, like Brad Scott has done a great job of looking at the different Amalekites over the years. That, uh, the, remember, he told us that we'll always be, every generation will be at war with, with Amalek. Amalek likes to come and nip at the, at the weak ones uh, around, uh, like a wolf does, around, around the edges of the flock and everything of, of Yah's people. And that's kind of how Amalek uh, uh, did. And that was the first people we battled on the way to the promised land. And uh, Brad has done a thing where he, he believes it was the Hyksos, which are uh, descendants of Esau, that, that may have been these new group of pharaohs that came in that wanted to, yeah. And which we see again, uh, the book of Esther there. Remember with Haman, he wanted to wipe out all of Yah's people. So th there's this end time uh, anti-Messiah, anti-Christ figure that's going to rise again in our days that's going to want to uh, take out Yah's people, okay? So I put in, you know, I highlighted the Joseph there because I, as I said here, there's no better type shadow in the, in the Torah of who Yeshua than Joseph and his lives, his life. There's a full 12 chapters in Genesis that are devoted to, to Joseph's life. And I, uh, here's just a quick overview of things that we can see that, that mirror our, our Savior's life. He was beloved of his father. His brothers rejected him. He was cast into a pit. And later, after uh, tempted and tried, he, he stayed true, but he was still thrown in prison. And, and prison could, could uh, re relate to the grave there. After that, he was raised to the right hand of the throne. And because of that, it, was, it brought salvation to many peoples in that time. Not, not only his brothers, but the entire region there were brought to uh, salvation by his w wisdom and, and the way he, they kept aside the food for everyone. So beautiful type shadow that, uh, that uh, are right there. And uh, I, I agree that e we should think about each of these Torah portions and think about how do they relate to our king? How, how do they relate to Yeshua? The apostles, when they went, it says they went to the synagogues week after week, and they took that Torah portion and talked about Yeshua in that Torah portion. So we, we want to be sure we, we can do the same. Um, I'm going to tie in a little bit about current events, uh, the stuff we see happening in, happening in the news now. Um, this new king that, that uh, we're, we're talking about here in uh, Exodus 1-8 uh, there. There's some end-time kings that are, are, are foretold that are going to uh, come on the scene, uh, likely in our days. Uh, Daniel 8 uh, starts the chapter with this powerful Iranian ruler. And uh, we see Iran's really much in the news right now. Um, uh, Daniel says that in his vision he saw in the citadel of Susa, in the province of Elam. Now that's the older name for Iran. When you see that in scripture, uh, Elam up there. Even all the old maps used to call it uh, Elam. And that, yep. Um, it wasn't until Hitler's time that uh, he felt that there are Aryan peoples and stuff. That they, in fact, Iran comes from the Aryan name and everything. So it's in any good encyclopedia or, or history book, you'll, you'll look back and, and realize that, that that area of Alam, which is that's where, remember, the Medes and the Persians came from. And they're still the Persian people today. Remember, so in Babylon, when the Medes and the Persians came in to attack Babylon and took over after uh, Nebuchadnezzar was there, uh, that uh, th they came from Alam. So. Um, yeah, so, uh, so Daniel's transported in his vision to Elam, uh, and then he's beside the Ulai Canal. He looked up, and there was this ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the, canal, and the horns were long. One was longer than the other, but it grew up later. And he watched the ram as he charged toward the west, the north, and the south, and no animal could stand against him, and none could rescue from his power. He did it as he pleased, and he became great. Now, we can look back in history and see some of these things that, that happened uh, historically. Because Daniel's book was fulfilled partially through uh, each of these different historical times with the uh, Medo-Persian Empire that came in and took over uh, Babylon. Remember, they waited before the, 
The rivers were low when they came, snuck in through the city gates into the city that, at that time. But, um, and Joel Richardson uh, brings this up quite a bit, he says the most important part of that, uh, this prophecy is when uh, Daniel was confused about what he saw, God sent the angel Gabriel to talk, talk to him. And he says, as he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and I fell prostrate. And he said, son of man, he said to me, understand that this vision concerns the time of the end. So he was ta talking about our days. So this, now that the first king here that we saw, the, uh, the goat one, or excuse me, the ram, the goat comes later. The goat is, is the Antichrist one in, in uh, Daniel 8. But before, uh, before the goat, something has to happen in Iran, as, as, as I see it here. Um, and it, it kind of made me wonder, because uh, you'll watch, and it says uh, the goat came f uh, fast, like through the air, uh, to, um, to this, and, and wipes out this Iranian guy. And it, it, it almost reminds me of what happened just a week or two ago when we, we sent in that missile uh, and took out their, their head general guy now. And it was almost like there were two horns, the general and, uh, and the uh, Ayatollah guy that's their religious leader today. But I think it's going to be, be something else. But it's, we're setting up the scene here uh, for Iran to rise on the world scene. And, and we have to keep our eyes on that because after that, that's when the goat comes. And, and that's essentially the Antichrist when he comes to set up his power here on earth. Yeah, and, and well, all of these are, and in fact, uh, Joel Richardson's books are, he does a really good job. There's, over the years, you know, if anybody's grew, grown up and read their Bible and looked at prophecy through, through your lifetime, people have guessed at who this is, is going to be and who these 10 nations are going to be, and, and people have surmised, well, maybe it's the European Economic Union or, you know, uh, other kind of things, uh, because we, we uh, years ago, the, uh, uh, the Islamic people seemed too backward and too... Uh, inept and, and they thought no way could they ever come to a strong world power you know uh, they, they seem like a, a second uh, world nation and the rest of that um, and but in our day so Joel Richardson's book is called the Islamic Antichrist and I, and I recommend reading it because he makes a strong argument that it's going to be the, an Islamic power in this day and when and when you look at because most of us have, have never studied much uh, Islamic writings and the rest of that where he examines their writings and you realize they're at a full 90 degree conflict with what the Bible says, with what the, uh, the Quran says. Their uh, end, end time uh, best guy is our worst guy. The, the, and and, and uh, our worst guy is their, their, uh, their number one guy. So you, you can see what we're on a collision course with these folks. And you can see why they could be so deceived. You know, when we read that it says the, the nations of the earth are, are there to do, do battle against Yeshua when he returns, you think, like, who could be crazy enough to want to do battle against Yeshua? Um, but if you're brought up your entire life, and, and that's the only holy writings you know, and, and, and to them, they think that our king, when he returns, is the bad guy, uh, the, you can see why they're going to uh, rise up and battle against him. So um, they're being set up, sadly, by Satan and, and pawns of his. And that's why we want to we pray for our Islamic brothers and sisters to uh, come out of that confusion and, and be, yeah, be delivered from that, that evil and, uh, and those strong influences in their life. Because uh, uh, I just read uh, CBN uh, last week here. One of the uh, major ISIS guys uh, accepted Messiah as his savior. So, yeah. So, it, you know, even the worst of these guys have a chance. And we, and we, we want to, uh, <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. And Father, please deliver more and more of them. I, we, you, we know that you said that you wish that none would perish, and we, we thank you for your deliverance. Um, so I, I went a little further in Daniel 8 there. In the latter part of the reign, it says, When the rebels have been completely wicked, then a stern-faced king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He'll become very strong, but not by his own power. He'll, he'll cause astounding devastation, and he's going to succeed in whatever he does. He's going to destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He'll cause deceit to prosper, and boy, is there a lot of deceit in the world today. Um, and, and I think there's going to be stronger and stronger delusion, especially with some of the things people can do with computers nowadays. There's, they're talking about these uh, fakes that, that, that look so real, you, you, you swear you're seeing something else, but uh, it, it can be extremely deceptive. That, that's why we have to really press into to him and, and be filled with his Holy Spirit so you have that discernment to know the difference. That's right. Yeah, no, amen. <laughs> and it says when, when, uh, when they feel secure, 
He's going to destroy many. He's going to take his stand against the prince of princes. I believe that's Yeshua. So, yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. The vision of the evenings and mornings that is give, given to you is true, but seal up the vision for it concerns the distant future. So again, so some of these things were fulfilled. Uh, uh, otherwise, Daniel would have been thought of as a false prophet the, throughout history in, in different historic times. Because uh, even the uh, during the Maccabean period, uh, which Daniel wrote about extensively, we saw that they set up the abomination of desolation there on the Temple Mount and, and offered to to Zeus at that time. Um, so we we know again once we have a temple functioning there, uh, as I see it, uh, there in Jerusalem, and I think we're moving closer and closer to that. I think our our president allowing a U.S. embassy there and the rest of that, we're se we're setting up. Uh, f finally, people are righteous. People are standing together to want uh, want to allow uh, Judah to be able to do that. So, uh, keeping your eyes uh, and and I think you uh, you guys are good. You you have some good leaders to to help teach on these things. So the uh, next thing I wanted to tie in here uh, was the idea of the greater Exodus. Um, there's been several teachers teach about the greater Exodus. I think Monty Judah has some, uh, some good insight and some good books about the, the subject. When we're reading these passages and going through the book of Exodus again, don't just look back as history. Think about well, how it's, this is going to be played out again in our lifetimes. Um, we, we know that uh, the book of Revelation is clear. Many of these same plagues are going to be poured out again on, on the peoples and, and the gods of this world will be judged again through many of these plagues. Um, I cited a lot of the scriptures that refer to greater Exodus things. Um, the Bible doesn't specifically call it the greater Exodus, but those, like those Jeremiah passages say that we're not going to be able to say anymore because how much of the Bible will say that I, I am Yahweh who brought you out of the land of sla slavery, out of the house of bondage, you know, so the, uh, that's how people knew him as their deliverer and, and how they referred to him. But he says, you'll no longer say that because it, uh, there's going to be, he says, now it'll be he who, who brought, the, brought you back from all the nations from where you were scattered. Because before that was the, they were kind of still in one spot there in, in uh, Egypt. But now we've been scattered all over the planet. And uh, so he's going to come with a great harvest and pull everybody in from all the nations and all around the world. And that'll be the big exodus. Uh, that's why they refer to it as the greater exodus. Um, so, what's that? Me too. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's, it's really, and, and it looks like, you know, just like uh, the passage in here about taking spoil, that we're going to probably take spoil from the other nations and everything as we come back and everything too. So, so a lot of it will be very similar. Um, that uh, Monty teaches that uh, it'll be at a, uh, a Hanukkah time. That, and why wouldn't it? Abba always usually uses the same pattern, same days, same uh, feast days to, to walk out the same uh, images. That uh, the Antichrist will probably set up that abomination of desolation on some future Hanukkah again. Um, and then likely uh, that next Passover will we'll have a, we'll leave, be leaving where you live. And, uh, and like I put, uh, I said, we'll again be living in Sukkot in the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit. And I said, Yahweh, again, will provide for our water and our food because there's plenty of scriptures in, in the prophets, Isaiah, uh, um, uh, a lot of them, where he talks about that he's going to give us waters in the wilderness again. So you just have to provide your shelter for your, you and your family. He's going to give you your food and water. OK, so uh, the, that's kind of nice that we don't have to uh, worry about those things. You know, and Mon Monte Judas got a little if, if you haven't seen it before, it's a little um, Sukkot uh, handbook on what kind of things you should be uh, stocking up on and what kind of things pr to prepare for that time. Um, I put in here that there may be times in the camp when, when the camp is tested with hunger and thirst, just, just as he tested them before. And I, and I, put, I put Yom Kippur after that because I said, you know, this is why we kind of practice at Yom Kippur to go a day without food and water. So you realize, hey, it's, it's okay. I'm not going to die. We're going we're gonna to make it through this, you know. And so um, we because if you look at... The example here that we're going to be reading through again, a lot of the troubles came when they were hungry and thirsty, and that's when they grumbled the most. So we, we hopefully we can learn from their example and not repeat these mistakes again to just be grumblers all the time. You say, okay, Father, I know, I know you'll give me the water before, before I die or when I need it, because uh, that rock is going to be with us in the wilderness again. Um, so I, I put in 
the beginning of Deuteronomy there when Moshe is looking back over that journey for 40 years. And he says, remember how Yahweh your God led you all the way in the desert those 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of Yahweh. Your clothes didn't wear out, your feet didn't swell in the 40 years, your, your shoes magically, or not magically, sorry, excuse me there, uh, just uh, d divine providence kept your, your uh, shoes fitting those 40 years. Um, and know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so, so Yahweh your God disciplines you. So there will be times when he's got to see what's in your heart because if it's too easy and, and, you know, we come from a very wealthy nation here in America. Most of us don't really know uh, true poverty and true hunger and thirst and uh, rest of that. Um, so he needs to test us to really know what's in our heart. And sometimes it's putting your flesh to, to, uh, through a little bit of hardship. Um, and th then he really knows where your heart is. You remember the book of Job there? Uh, Satan was a little like, well, look, it's sure that he's, he loves you and he, he blesses you because look at how easy Job's got it. He's a rich man. And he said, you, you said, if you take away his riches, then let's, then let's see what he does. But, and then, yep, and then Job survived that test. So I hope and pray that we all have the fortitude to, to make it through those hard times too. Um, so I'm, I put in here uh, that a nearly three and a half year time we'll, we'll spend in the wilderness. I don't see that it's going to be a 40 year period. Uh, and you know, Abba didn't intend them to go 40 years either, remember? It was because they leave the, believed the bad report. So uh, hopefully we've uh, learned that lesson well enough. <clears throat> but uh, I put in that final year. Now, Monte Judah doesn't see it this way, but I've, I've read some other books that I, I feel convinced that there will be a time um, when we are going to be taken up. There's The, the pre-tribulation rapture is, is a lie of the enemy, and I think that's that's going to cause a lot of people to lose their faith when things start to get bad and they're not raptured out of here. There's going to be that maybe that great falling away. But there is a, a time when I believe we'll be taken up. And it sure looks like it's going to happen on the day of trumpets. When that resurrection, the, the righteous dead will rise and, and we who are uh, uh, left here will, will rise up with them. Yeah, happy day. Amen. That's right. Um, and we'll be taken up into heaven somewhere. It doesn't talk about that Yeshua says comes down at that time. That that happens a little bit later, okay? So I don't know where we'll be taken, possibly to the New Jerusalem up there. Um, and we're taken up and because Yom Kippur is the, is the type shadow of the marriage. It's the day we wear all white. And the, the high priest, instead of his colorful garments, wore white and went, went into the bridal chamber that, that day and representing all of Israel. So we'll, we'll be there for the, uh, the wedding ceremony. Um, and I say we're kept there for a year and 10 days um, because if you look at how long Noah's Ark was above the earth, okay, good, good pattern on salvation with the time of Noah with those eight that were saved in the Ark. If, if you look at the, what the Bible tells us, it, uh, they were above the earth for a year and 10 days. So I, uh, where's the, this type pattern of a year and 10 days? The only way it works out for Yah's feast days is with this uh, Feast of Trumpets or Day of Trumpets and this Day of Atonement time, which the Day of Atonement is 10 days later, right? So, I, and, and we also see, uh, what did I say? Because there's this whole idea of atonement and everything too. The Ark, it says the same Kippur for Yom Kippur is the Ark was covered, it was uh, Kippur, it was covered, because uh, the, uh, the word is, yeah, the pitch was uh, covered in pitch. So it, it was a time of Kippur, of, uh, of covering and, and atonement, you know, uh, being in Noah's Ark. Um, and this, uh, the whole Yom Kippur, uh, Nathan Lawrence uh, did a great uh, teaching years ago about uh, how Yom Kippur ties down with uh, the seven bowl judgments of Yahweh's wrath that are poured out on the earth at that time. Because it's the, those uh, sprinkling seven times, the, uh, the high priest had the bowl with the blood in it. And, and, it was, and he had to sprinkle everything to make it clean for the entire year again. So there's uh, the idea of those seven bulls judgment. And, and scripture talks about that we're not appointed to wrath. Um, this is the, the, the great tribulation and the time of Yah's wrath are different times. Um, and there's a, there's a good book. He's a Christian man. In fact, he pretty much lost his major ministry. Um, if you, want, if you want to read about it, I can uh, look it up later because I recently reordered another copy of it. 
It's good for your Christian friends that do believe in a pre-Christian rapture, a pre-tribulation rapture, because he lays out every major argument and every major scripture and looks at those mm-hmm. to show that that's that's a false teaching and it, it doesn't belong. And um, so, but he says it's a it's a not pre-tribulation; it's a pre-wrath rapture. Uh, and so, the the idea of getting us out of here before Yah's wrath is poured out, and uh, that's part of the cleansing of this. The altar is his. Uh, uh, the earth is his altar. So he's cleansing the altar here before he can come back. I says then Yeshua his and his warrior bride can come back down to earth and he can set his feet here on the Mount of Olives. He, he's essentially cleansed the uh, the earth with the with his wrath or with those seven bowl judgments. Um, and now the other pattern that this beautifully fits with is that uh, remember uh, can a young, a young man that's recently married is he allowed, uh, permitted to go off to war according to Torah? No, he's not. 